Caregivers webinar on emotional intelligence in the workplace. This session is being recorded. Um, this workshop will help you to better understand your own emotional intelligence and ways you can strengthen your skills in the area when interacting with peers, staff, clients, and at the workplace. Um, this webinar is brought to you by uh, Safe Care BC, uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association, British Columbia, with funding from <clears throat> the BC Ministry of Health. And I'm so sorry, my computer keeps freezing. There you go. I would like to start today um, with a land acknowledgement. So while we are on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land in which we each call home or where we work. So the Safe Care BC offices are located on the ancestral unceded homelands of the Musqueam and Squamish speaking peoples. We are grateful for the opportunity to learn, live and work on the shared territory. Um, I just want to give a quick introduction of our wonderful speaker. So we're here um, to hear from Lucette Wells Wesley, consultant and master trainer in various workplace mental health programs and the Psychological Health and Safety Advisor Program. Uh, there's over, she has over 25 years of experience as a manager and director of large disability claims operations, and her personal lived experience allows her to understand the impact um, of pre presenteeism, absenteeism, and disability has on the organization and the challenges managers face in addressing these particular areas of the work, uh, workplace mental health. So um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Lisette. Thank you very much for that introduction. So yes, I am working for the CMHA. And as you were just told, it's a, a co collaboration between us, Care for Caregivers, with funding from the Ministry of Addictions and Substance Use. And so CMHA has been around for a long time. Most of you have probably heard of us, um, if you're local particularly, um, but we're a charity. We've been around for more than 100 years now. And everything we do is evidence-based, but also we talk about personal experiences because we listen to people who have struggled with mental illness and we learn from them. And so I have myself some lived experience at a time where I was managing a staff of 200. I developed both depression and then anxiety. And I self-stigmatized because at that time, um, which was about 17 years ago, we really didn't talk about mental health in the workplace. And certainly we didn't know what to do about it either. And so now what I do with CMHA is I do workshops on mental health within workplaces in all kinds of different topics, because I think it's so important that at work, we think about what's going on for us and we do early intervention. The earlier we can take care of ourselves to get better, um, the better the situation. So we have 120 locations throughout Canada and 14 here in BC. Um, so some of you are from all over, there's some people from the States as well. Um, so uh, we have websites and we have uh, different programs offered in each of our locations, both in BC and across the country as well. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about emotional in uh, intelligence, and I'll start with just an introduction. Then we're going to talk about emotional triggers and how they can have an impact. Then we're going to talk about the five attributes of emotional intelligence, how you can respond more effectively, um, both when you are triggered or just generally. And then we're going to talk about resources, but these will be BC resources, things that are here, although some of them are websites that can be accessed from anywhere. And we will be sending you the slides after the workshop, so don't worry about taking notes. You will get all of this later. Um, so. Let's get started. Emotional intelligence. Well, what is it? So there is an expert. Um, somebody's asking if they're supposed to see the slides. Um, so what that probably means is you're probably not set up to see the slides. Oh, sorry, um, Lisa, I don't think you're sharing your screen anymore. Do you want to try to ah, do that? Oh, yeah. well, that's when you started sharing. Yeah. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that that had taken me off. Okay, so here we go. So emotional intelligence, let's talk about what it is. So Daniel Goleman is someone who first started talking about emotional intelligence quite a long time ago. And he has really been the guru of emotional intelligence for quite some time. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is work he has done. And he has talked about 
five attributes of emotional intelligence. Initially, he started with four, then he added a fifth. And we're going to review all of that in more detail in a few minutes. But I want to just define this a little bit. So emotional is really about our feelings. And our feelings and our emotions drive a lot of what we do. And, you know, a lot of what we feel if we're really stressed is that fight, flight, or freeze response. And emotions really communicate to us and to others what we're experiencing. And in the case of mental health, what we may need help with or that we need some support. So emotions tell us something important in our life is changing or needs attention. And so that's important for us to recognize that. Then intelligence, well, you know what that is. It's the ability to learn, understand, and think in a logical way about things and the ability to do that well. But sometimes our emotions can get in the way of us using our intelligence. So let's talk about what emotional intelligence is. It's the ability to identify and manage our own emotions and reactions. And it also includes our ability to identify the emotions of others and to respond in a way that's effective. This is the definition that's in the Workplace Strategies for Mental Health.com website, and they have quite a lot of resources there on emotional intelligence. And I have that listed again in our resource page at the very end, their website and some of the areas you can go to. But it's the ability to identify and manage our own emotions and reactions, but also to identify it in others. So Daniel Goleman talked about IQ, which is emotional intelligence, or sorry, IQ, which is what we all know as our intelligence quotient, that that contributes only 20% to our success in life, but that our EQ, emotional intelligence, and some people refer it to it as EI as well. So EQ or EI mean the same thing, emotional intelligence, that it is responsible for 80%, which includes many factors that we're gonna to touch on later. So IQ and EQ are not opposing skills, but they do work separately. So it's possible to be intellectually brilliant, Daniel Goleman says, but emotionally unfit. And that kind of misalignment causes the biggest problems in people's lives. And you can imagine how that would uh, appear within workplaces as well. And how he described it is that we have an essence, or in a sense, two minds, one rational and one that feels. They usually work in harmony, but sometimes when we have intense feelings, that's when we allow sometimes unconsciously the emotional mind to dominate. And like all things, there need to be balance between those two. So being intelligent about emotions, it doesn't mean we're soft. It doesn't mean um, that we're not smart, but it's just a different way of being smart. So when we're intelligent about emotions, we can deal successfully with others. We can understand our own feelings. We can manage ourselves. We can motivate others. And we can respond appropriately to situations. And all of that fosters teamwork. So in the workplace, very important because teamwork is a big part of everything that we do. So emotional intelligence is particularly important when we're triggered by others. So let's talk about those emotional triggers. So there's many things in our everyday life that can trigger us and we can react in ways that are not helpful. So here are some come common triggers that we might have and in our interpersonal connections with others. So if your reaction to a behavior is really intense, emotionally intense, you're feeling those really strong feelings, then that behavior is a trigger for you. And it's really important to understand what our triggers are so that we're prepared when something happens to think about it and not respond automatically. So here's a few behaviors that might trigger you. <clears throat> it might be aggression or hostility. 
I know that's one that, you know, I know triggers me and I have to be careful how I respond. Always needing to please. Anger, arrogance, being ignored or not listened to. Blaming, conceit, criticizing or judging. Some people are always criticizing. And if that happens to be in a leadership role, then that becomes one of the triggers often for us because we start having strong emotions around that. Crying, deceit or lying. Disrespect. Disrespect is a big one for me as well when people don't respect. And I see that more and more in today's workplaces. And then entitlement, people who are entitled. Now there's more. There's fresh, if people are frustrated or irritated, high, strung, or intense, manipulative, passive aggressive, you know, they're going behind and doing things, but they won't upfront talk about the issues. Sadness or moping, sarcasm, silent treatment, unhappiness or misery, the victim mentality, whining, worry, or nervousness. So we can even demonstrate some of these ourselves in our written communications because who hasn't seen emojis? And when we have emojis, we're really talking about our feelings. We're talking about what's going on. And oftentimes it's because we've been triggered. Now, some of them are positive or we're just smiling. But when you see the other emojis, like at the bottom right-hand side here, where it's really angry, Again, it's a way of, of expressing our emotions. So do you recognize any of these triggers? It's important for us to recognize and understand the emotions that they create in us. Because only once we recognize them and we can understand what's happening to our own emotions, can we do something about it. We can have automatic responses and triggers. It's human, it's human to do that. It's a human tendency to respond in the same way as the behaviors we're getting. We call that mirroring. So if someone's angry at us, we might just automatically start getting angry and we respond in that same way. That's what mirroring is. And when we talk about de-escalating situations, we always talk about don't mirror, but come up with a different way of responding. So sometimes we act without thinking first, and that can happen to us, or it can happen to the other person we're interacting with as well. And what experts tell us is that anger, anxiety, and sadness are the most common emotions that we as humans struggle with. Anger might come when you feel you're being manipulated or disrespected or played in some way. Anxiety might be when you're worried about what might be coming next, worried about things in the future that, you know, may or may not happen. Sadness. You think the other person is looking very sad or and even hopeless, and then you feel sad when you're interacting with them. But we can have all kinds of other emotional responses as well. Pity. If you feel the other person is weak or defeated. You might have pity for them. Shame or guilt. Maybe when you feel their emotion is somehow your fault. Defensiveness or hostility. When you feel they're blaming you for something. Or it might be frustration or overwhelm. When you feel pressure to deal with other people's emotions. Might be fear. When you expect the situation to escalate into something much worse. Emotions serve a purpose. They tell us that something needs attention. But we need to think about that. Maybe something important in our life is changing, or maybe it's something that we need to address. We may need to change our own thoughts or attitudes, or we may need to change something in our relationships or our environment. We all may find that we are less effective at work when we ignore or deny those emotions. So it's not sweeping it under the carpet. It's not forgetting about it. It doesn't mean we need to be unprofessional or that we can be emotional all day at work, but it means we need to be aware of the information our emotions may be communicating to us. Now, maybe at work you get angry when you're given new tasks because you're feeling overwhelmed already. 
or you feel it's unfair that you have more work than perhaps a coworker sitting next to you, or that that extra work will impinge on your home life. Well, your emotions can lead you to think and find solutions to address the issues, not just responding without thinking. This ability to recognize and assess our own responses is part of emotional intelligence. There's a lot of wisdom in our emotions, including those we think are negative. So ignoring negative emotions often means that they're going to come back again and again. It's like thoughts coming into your head. You can't just say, go away, thought. I don't want to have you because it'll come back. And those emotions will be created by those thoughts. So they're connected. When we examine the wisdom of our, our emotions and what they can teach us, we'll be more likely to move forward in a healthy way and find some solutions. So what can we do? Well, the first thing is to learn your triggers. That's why we started with triggers. Self-awareness is knowing how you're likely to respond to a particular situation. So once you know what your triggers are and you know the emotions they create, you know how you're going to respond. So now think of a different way to respond. And remember that your emotions can shift everything. They can shift what you're thinking. They can shift what you're feeling. And that can shift how you're acting. So think before you act. Stop. Take a moment. And then try to see things from the other person's perspective. So what is causing them to be triggered or to trigger you? Empathize with them. See their perspective. You can understand their beliefs and values if you spend the time to find out. And that might be very important for motivating and engaging others because what is it that they believe in and their values? And what is it that you may have said or done that might have triggered them? So self-awareness, realistic appreciation of our strengths and weaknesses and how they come across to others is another important piece. Because sometimes we have blind spots. And we don't know how we're coming across to others. So peer feedback is a good way to develop that awareness and possibly uncover those emotional blind spots that you may have. Be on the lookout for other people's body language and other nonverbal signs. They may tell you more than what people are willing to share with you. But also your own body language and your own nonverbal signs. And sometimes it's important to get that pure feedback so that people can tell you how you come across so that you can recognize the things that perhaps you do unconsciously that perhaps trigger others. So let's dig a little deeper into emotional intelligence and those five attributes um, that Daniel Goldman talked about. <clears throat> so here are the attributes. And it starts from the top to the right. So it's self-awareness and then it's self-regulation. And then it's self-motivation, empathy and social relationships and awareness. And then those relationships, skill relation, social skills and relationship management. So let's look at each of these individually. So here's the first, self-awareness. And by the way, I'm fine if you have questions to ask them as we go along. Um, I don't have a problem with that. So stop me. Use your raise hand if you want to ask a question. I'll leave a few minutes at the end as well uh, for questions, but feel free to do that as we go along. So self-awareness is re recognizing your own emotions, understanding your reactions, and the impact that you have on others. So it's knowing your triggers and your responses. This shifts your mental activities away from the amygdala, which is our oldest part of our brain. It's where we kind of respond automatically. It's a primitive reaction. It shifts it away from that to the neocortex to make the unconscious conscious. So just awareness. 
So if someone screams at you in anger and you can't control the emotions you feel or you think in that moment, remember that emotions are fleeting. They don't last. Before you react, remember that it's temporary. Making rash decisions based on intense emotions can be detrimental to your long-term goals and success. So that's when self-regulation kicks in. So self-regulation is you're able to control impulsive feelings and behaviors, manage your emotions and reactions, and effectively regulate stress. Because when we're triggered, that feeling is often also a stressful response. So this helps us not to mirror the behaviors that we see, but to respond appropriately in each situation. So with self-regulation, people learn how to control their emotions instead of just allowing the emotions to control them. So think about a time where you had that emotional response and all of a sudden your emotions were controlling everything you did. We all have that some time in our experience where that has happened. So think what would have happened had you just stopped for a moment, taken a deep breath and really thought before you acted. Would it have changed the situation? This is often what we talk about when we describe de-escalation recognizing what's happening for you and trying to understand what's happening for the other person and then responding in a way that helps not hinders the situation. So that's self-regulation. Now let's talk about motivation. You manage your impulses so they support your goals and you feel a sense of purpose in your work. You stay motivated and persistent even when there are setbacks. So sometimes, you know, we get feedback that's really negative. We might respond in a way that would not be helpful for our learning, for our development, for our moving forward. So our emotions change our ability to think and plan our future. And when we deal with them, it allows us to reach our goals and define our performance. Sometimes we need to forego that instant gratification that we might get by just yelling back at someone and just getting them because they were angry at us for more long-term successes. Maybe you need that relationship. Maybe you need to develop a better relationship with that person. So when working with others, we need to look beyond their behaviors because what you see is a behavior. You don't know what's going on, just a behavior to try and understand what the need is that they're trying to meet because they have needs just like you do. We all at work, at home, in our lives, try and meet our needs. And so what are the needs that that other person might um, have? And if we try and understand our needs and perhaps theirs, and we understand that our behaviors are usually an attempt to meet those needs, that helps us then to recognize how we might change our responses. So for example, if you're at work and someone is resisting change, it may be because they're afraid to fail. Um, it may be that they don't understand what's really expected. If we only respond to the resistance and not to what may be underlying it, we may not move forward, but if we ask what concerns they may have or ask for suggestions for improvements, we can reduce resistance and have more success in the end. Sometimes a casual comment we make can elicit a response we never expected. Maybe someone gets very defensive. So rather than mirroring their defensiveness, we can be curious and find out about what their underlying need is that was not met. We all know that there are many ways for motivation. If you've ever studied motivation, lots of things motivate us. Some people it's wealth, money, some people it's fame, power. But for people with high emotional intelligence, often it's simply doing a good job that is enough for them to get up every morning. 
Their motivation comes from enjoying what they do. They follow their passions and love reaching the goals that they set for themselves. In other words, they have intrinsic motivation rather than external motivation. We're going to talk about each of these again in a moment and talk about examples of how you can do each of these. Empathy and social awareness. You can understand the emotions, needs, and concerns of other people and respond in a supportive, non-judgmental way. A very important skill in anyone in leadership or in service environments, or if you're in a teaching role. So this becomes especially important when making business decisions that affect people in very different ways. Empathizing with others involves reading verbal and nonverbal cues from coworkers, as they may not always directly tell you how they're feeling. And we'll talk about empathy in more detail in a few minutes as well. Relationships. Social skills, relationship management. You know how to develop and maintain good relationships in a respectful, non-defensive manner, particularly if you are providing feedback or managing interpersonal conflict, or when you yourself are receiving feedback as well. It helps you to negotiate solutions. Another very important aspect if you're in a leadership role. So being able to interact well with others is another important aspect of emotional intelligence. Through really true emotional understanding involves more than just considering your own emotions and those of others. You need to be able to put this information to work in your daily interactions and communications. So in professional settings, managers benefit by being able to build relationships and connections with their employees. Workers benefit from being able to develop a strong rapport with leaders and coworkers. And important social skills include active listening, verbal communication skills, nonverbal communication skills, leadership and persuasiveness. And we will talk about all of that in a moment again. So how do you respond? So this is putting it in action. So you have choices to make. You can respond immediately and mirror that other action, or you can find a more emotionally intelligent way to respond. So let's think about self-awareness. So the first thing about self-awareness, you know you've just been triggered, something's going on, is to stay calm. Notice the body language, yours and theirs. What's it telling you? How are you feeling? Ask yourself the question, why am I reacting this way? What has happened in my past? And this is about knowing what triggers you and doing that work up ahead of time if you can. What is it that's happened in my life that makes that so triggering for me? Recognize that you have strengths and you have weaknesses because we all have these instant reactions that happen. It's, it's a human trait but we can learn to use our strengths to combat those reactions that we automatically have. And remember that those emotions are fleeting and how you respond is up to you. If you take a moment to think and plan your response, you can respond in a way that will lead to better results. So let's talk about self-regulation. So take a moment before you respond, as we just said. Don't forget about mirroring. Very important to understand that human trait of mirroring. We see something, a behavior, we respond with the same behavior. Try not to do that. Take a deep abdominal breath before you respond and take three. So take a deep breath from your stomach instead of from your diaphragm. Count to four as you breathe in, hold it for four and release it for four and do it three times. What that does is that calms you. That takes away that emotional stuff that's happening in your head and allows you to be calmer because you've now put more oxygen to your brain. And it's not about hiding emotions because 
You need those emotions to help you, to learn from, to understand what's going on. But there's a right time and a right place to express those emotions. So it's probably not right then and there. I remember a situation where I was in the middle of an office. I was a leader at that time. And one of my staff yelled at me in public in front of all sorts of other staff. And I could feel my reaction. I was angry. So I looked at her and I said, we'll talk later. I left because that's all I could say in that moment. And later on, she came and apologized to me because she knew what she had done was probably not appropriate. And then we chatted and we talked about what the issue was that she was um, concerned about. But I knew in that moment that I would not have the right response. And so I didn't respond at all, just postponed it. And then listen and understand their perspective. If you can do it right then, once you've calmed, wonderful. If you need a moment, it's okay to say, can we talk about that later? Let's talk this afternoon at two o'clock. And then you can go regulate your emotions, get down you know, the, the temperature for yourself and then respond in a better way then. Recognize when things are out of your control because some things you can't do anything about. You can't control. So recognize that. And then look for constructive responses or constructive solutions, ways that can be a win-win. And if you've had a really difficult situation, debrief. Find someone to talk to about that situation because debriefing is very important because you were at a very intense emotional level and you addressed it, but that some of what's lingering may be important for you to talk to someone about. And in debriefing, it's to make sure you do low impact debriefing, which means asking the other person that you're gonna talk to if it's okay to debrief. So you might say something like, you know, I had a really difficult interaction with someone. I'd like to talk to somebody about it. You know, are you okay if we talk about this? And then let them know why you wanna debrief. Is it debriefing because you just wanna vent? Is it debriefing because you want to find a solution? Is it debriefing because you think you said something that triggered them and you want to find out what it might have been? So to repeat what you said, or do you want to find a different way of approaching something and you want some help? So choose the right person to debrief with depending on what you want to do in your debrief. And then relieve your stress because you're probably stressed out after that situation. So do hobbies, meditation, go for a walk. Going outside in nature, very important. Just do something to regulate how you're feeling if you have some leftover emotions. So the ability to regulate and manage your emotions, it's not putting them on lockdown or hiding your true feelings. It means waiting for the right time and place to express them. It's all about expressing your emotions appropriately. So when you recognize that you've been triggered, just stop, take a few deep breaths, actively listen to the individual to understand their perspective, and then you can respond. And as I said earlier, it's often because there's a perceived or actual need. And so what is it? What is it that's missing for them? What is it that they need to be successful or to feel fulfilled? What is it that's missing? Let's talk about that a little bit when we get to empathy as well. Now, the next one is motivation. <clears throat> so you want to understand your own needs because our own needs often um, impact on what triggers us. And work to achieve your goals. But think about the long term. So sometimes our reactions are very short-term reactions that may not support our long-term goals. And so if you re react with anger or um, with some kind of disdain, lack of respect, whatever it is, you may fracture a relationship that's really important in your work. So maybe you need to think about the long-term here. How do you rebuild a relationship with someone? It's easier to not destroy that relationship than to rebuild it later. Focus on the positive aspects of whatever happened, because sometimes we may be in a situation where there's some things going on that are not so bad, and then there's a triggering issue. So focus on the positive aspects of what 
the interaction was. And make sure that you yourself follow what you're passionate about. It's really important in our own motivation to know what we're passionate about and to do that in our day-to-day. And maybe it's not at work. Maybe it's what you do at home. But passion is important. Practice having an optimistic attitude because that also helps in our motivation, thinking about things from a positive perspective. And avoid chasing down material rewards. Because those are those external extrinsic rewards that really don't fulfill a lot of our more important needs. Um, And emotionally intelligent people talk about their intrinsic, the needs that they have internally, not those external ones. And let's talk about empathy. So you're triggered by someone's anger. And ask yourself, why did they react that way? What did I say that might have upset them? Are they angry because they have a need that's not met? Like maybe I was being unfair? Or maybe they need to be perceived as competent. And maybe the way I gave feedback um, led them to feel diminished. It's a need for privacy, maybe. Maybe I talk to them in public and that um, triggered them. Maybe they like to be respected for their opinions and I just shot down that opinion. Maybe they need recognition for the work that they do, for their efforts. And maybe I'm just giving them the negative stuff and I'm not talking about when they do good work. Maybe they have a need to have work that they can accomplish during the day and not feel overwhelmed. Maybe they need support to correct the mistake I just pointed out to them, hopefully in a constructive way. So how can I support them? So what is that need? It's about thinking about all of those um, potential needs that someone might have. And if you have never watched the Brene Brown video on empathy, I would highly recommend you do that. We don't have time to do it today. But Brene Brown in her video on empathy talks about four components. And it's recognizing the perspective that another person has. And that perspective is their truth. So no matter what you think, if that's the perspective of that other person, that is what they believe. That is their truth. Even if you didn't mean something, you didn't say it the way you meant it, what they understood is their truth. See things from their point of view. It can be challenging, especially if you feel like the other person is wrong. But rather than letting disagreements build up into major conflicts, spend time looking at the situation from their perspective. I know I'm repeating a lot of these things, but it's really important. It can be a great first step towards finding a middle ground between two opposing points of view. Stay out of judgment. So if we're listening to someone, don't judge. Or at least not too quickly. Try and get additional information before you start putting judgment on folks. And recognize that the emotions they're having and communicate that emotion. And the way you can do that is by acknowledging what's going on with them. I can see how difficult this is for you. I can see how this workload is becoming very difficult for you to be able to handle in a day. Let's talk about that. Recognizing their emotions, it's very, I can see how Um, sad you are about that situation. Let's talk about what we could do to fix it. So recognizing the emotion, communicating it. It's really what we talk about when we feel with people. And we have to be careful, of course, that we don't get drawn in and ourselves start to feel compassion fatigue or just start to getting ill because We're feeling the feelings of other people. But in those moments when we're trying to understand what's going on, it's important to understand their perspective and put ourselves in their place so that we can understand what might be going on. That is empathy. 
And definitely, if you have a chance, view the Brene Brown video. It's a it's an awesome one. It's on YouTube. Now, social skills. This is about building relationships and connections. Important in every aspect of our life, not just work. Practice mindful listening. And that means listening with your full attention. Not watching the clock, not looking away, not looking at your phone, but mindfully listening. And listening means not interrupting as well. Paying attention. And be aware of your verbal and nonverbal communication when you're listening. You know, are you leaning in forward to hear? Are you going, uh-huh, tell me more. And then what happened? You're trying to give them some cues so that they can continue to tell you what's going on. Monitor your email and social media communication because often what we put in emails is not what we intended to mean or for people to feel because in an email or a social media communication, People don't see your expressions, don't see your face, don't know what was behind it. All they see are the words. So be very careful about those. Be constructive in feedback. When you're giving feedback, it's about helping someone to do better. And so make sure it's constructive. Build trust. Follow through on anything you commit to. And if you're in a leadership role, this is something that's extremely important. Be approachable. What makes people approachable? Getting to know your staff, getting to know your coworkers, getting to know the people around you and being open. You can show that by nonverbal communication as well as verbal communication. So be available. Respect others' opinions. So important. We've talked about this a lot. Um, it shows, res sorry, it shows respect to the other person. You may not agree, and that's okay. And you can have a different opinion and you can come to some consensus by sharing each other's opinions. Respect the boundaries, both yours and theirs. Um, and that's things like, make sure that you take breaks during the day, make sure you take lunch, make sure that you don't take work home with you at night and make sure you do that for others as well. Make sure that you don't want to meet with someone when it's their break time, their lunch time. Um, make sure that you um, don't talk about topics that perhaps the other person doesn't wanna talk about or you express that you don't wanna talk about those topics because that's one of your boundaries. So there's lots of different ways we can um, set boundaries. And those boundaries are ours to set. And if you don't know what the other person's boundaries are, think about it. Think about what might be important to that other person and their boundaries. Be open to feedback. You know, no one likes to hear that they've made mistakes or that they've not done well, but we learn from them. So we need to be open to feedback and express appreciation to others when they provide you with feedback. Or when someone opens up to you and tells you about what's going on for them, express that appreciation. And don't ignore conflict. Conflict is one of those things that, you know, conflict avoidance, it doesn't accomplish anything because the conflict is still there. The conflict does not go away. What you need to do is find some solutions, find some ways to actually um, get a solution that works for both, a win-win solution. And then in the workplace, stay calm and productive under pressure. How do you stay calm? Take those deep breaths. Go for a quick walk. Just take a moment for silence. Do mindfulness if you need to. You can do a five-minute mindfulness, a 15-minute mindfulness. Sorry, just get a nap. Accept constructive feedback. Accept and embrace change. Accept responsibility for mistakes you make and move on. We all make them. We're human. It's part of being human to make mistakes. Say no when you need to. And in the workplace, maybe it's not no, but maybe it's not now. Can you help me prioritize what I have so that I can do this? Right now, I wouldn't be able to. Constructively share your feelings with others. Have empathy. Acknowledge differences. Practice those listening skills and be non-judgmental. A lot of this is repetitious, but it's all things we need to think about. And if you are a leader, use this list to help you develop emotional intelligence. Get to know your employees. Actively listen to understand. 
Recognize assumptions and biases that you may have. We all have them. We all make assumptions about people, those first impressions, and sometimes they last, and we all have biases, but we need to recognize them and put them aside. Acknowledge differences. Communicate effectively. Think about your emails. Provide constructive feedback. Solve problems in ways that work for everyone. Be non-judgmental language. Try to understand needs. Avoid blaming or shaming. Acknowledge other people's perspective, express respect and appreciation, and use inclusive approaches. Understand diversity because as a leader, you need to understand that everyone in your organization and the people who report to you will be different, come from different backgrounds, different experiences, have different life situations they dealt with. So understand that diversity. And that's where it's important to get to know your employees. And so we have 10 minutes left. I'm just going to talk quickly about resources and then I'll ask any questions, answer any questions if you have any that I didn't address. So one of them is for emotional uh, intelligence, you can actually do an assessment. So if you want to know what your emotional intelligence is, Workplace Strategies for Mental Health has emotional intel intelligent assessment and it will give you the results and then it'll give you some ideas on how you can improve in each of those five um, attributes. Mind Tools video, Developing Emotional um, Intelligence. There's a video that just talks about some things. Um, it's very a light, quick video, but it can be helpful. The Brene Brown um, video, YouTube on emotional intelligence. And then Workplace Strategies for Mental Health, the same one as the Emotional Intelligent Assessment, is a very good resource for all sorts of things. This first one is emotional intelligence for employees. The next one is emotional intelligence for leaders and relationship management for emotional intelligence. And you'll find a lot of what's in there um, is things that I've addressed through this workshop. Um, it, most of the resources on emotional intelligence have um, very similar concepts and themes. Now, for your own well-being, if you are interested, here to help.bc.ca is one of our resources that has all sorts of things on different topics, and it has wellness modules. And so these wellness modules are really interesting, and it talks about problem solving, anger management. Um, it has healthy thinking. I highly recommend that one because it talks about all those things that come into our heads sometimes. Uh, and how we can respond to those thoughts. And it leads you into an online tool as well. <clears throat> and then, sorry, Lucette, there's just a question that popped up in the chat. Um, okay. So the question is, practice, practicing and using emotional intelligence skills can be exhausting with certain people who have low emotional intelligence, especially ones that push back no matter the attempts made to resolve the conflict. How do you protect yourself from becoming drained from these interactions or having a resolution feel very one-sided. Mm -hmm. That's very difficult. So these are just resources from CMHA. Most of you probably know these are completely free. So I'll just leave that with you. Bounce Back is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Confidence Parents is for parents with children who are struggling. So those are resources you can use. Let me just, um, there's a lot of other things CMHA does around uh, workshops. And then I'll get to this question. Okay. So practicing using, it can be exhausting with people who have low emotional intelligence. So what I would suggest is that you really think about what we talked about earlier about needs. Most of the time when people have concerns, when they're not responding the way you'd like them to, when there's something that's not appropriate, it's because there's some need that they have that isn't being met. And what might that be? Because everyone is different in what's important to them. For a lot of people, you know, just plain old respect and um, valuing their work 
is what they need, but for others, it may be other things. And so it's important to understand that person. And as I said before, diversity is interesting because you don't know what kind of background that person has, what their early life might have been like, whether there was any abuse in their lives, whether they, you know, what their education level is, you should know. There's a lot that you would know, but there's a lot you may not know. And so it's to try and understand what might be underlying it. Because if you just try something and then it doesn't work and then you just give up, well, that's not going to lead to a resolution. But really try to understand what motivates that person? What are their needs? What is it that I'm not giving them or they're not getting from the work or from the relationship? And try and find that out. And if this is a friend, it may be that you just won't continue a relationship with that person because it's not the right fit for you. If it's in the workplace, then it's really important that you spend the time to understand that because you're going to have to work with that person. So I hope that helps. And I if, think that there's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Anybody? Who is? I was just going to see, oh, there's somebody's raised their hands. Yeah. Um, Hello, oh. we have a question. Richard Menno. Yes. yes. No one can make you do or say anything. It's how you choose to react to each individual situation. Absolutely. Thank you, Corey. We choose how we respond. And if we respond immediately, then we let the emotions choose for us. But if we take the time, then we can make a choice on how we respond. It's the same thing with our thoughts. You can't change the thoughts that come into your head, but you can change how you respond to them. And when I do training on other mental health topics, I talk about stress. What's stressful is often not the thing that's happening. It's how we respond to the thing that's happening. So it's our responses that are important. And if we take the time to figure it out, think about it, then um, we'll have a better response. So I see people are starting to leave. So um, I'll stay on for any other questions. If you need to leave, by all means, um, go ahead. Um, what I want you to think about is every single day, I, I end all my workshops this way, make sure that you do something that's fun, something that's healthy for yourself, because we need to replenish. At the end of a work day, we usually have lost a lot of energy because we've been doing a lot all day. So we would need to replenish. So always do something fun something that's healthy for yourself and um, do it every single day, whatever it is. So have a great day if you don't need to, if you have to go, and we will be sending you a copy of these slides for sure. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We do have some more time for questions. If you'd like to stay ask questions, I will be sending up a post-webinar email with um, the recording, as well as the slide deck, any resources that were mentioned today, as well as some information on our Care for Caregivers website. So Care for Caregivers is a program in collaboration with the CMHABC, Safe Care BC, as well as the Ministry of Health, which has funded us. And we'll have information on our Care for Caregivers webinars, such as this pre-recorded webinars, our Care to Speak program, where you're able to, healthcare workers are able to get in touch with someone over the phone, text, or web-based to get support for any issues that they may be going through, as well as our podcast that we are working on. Um, and our podcast, we are currently having a call to action for speakers. If you have any topics you'd like to discuss, any speakers you'd like to hear on our podcast, let us know as well. Um, and again, if there's any other questions, uh, so there was one question that just popped up in the chat and it said, it said, can you go to the slide with the assessment site? I would like to do that right now. I can, we oh. will send, we'll send up that, all that information out to you, um, the assessment and all the resources that were linked here. Just go to workplace strategies for mental health and just search emotional intelligence assessment. And you'll get the copies of all of these resources for sure. Corey, you still have your hand up. Did you mean to put it down or is it still there? Yes, we have some comments here. Okay. 
mental health should be called emotional mental wellness because that's what we're shooting for. Yeah. Mental health is the good stuff. It's the wellness stuff. Mental illness is when we're not well. So yeah, you're you're totally right. Someone oh, asked how it, oh, go ahead. Thank you, said Jose. I'm a support worker in the enrichment with RCFC. Um, you, you touched it briefly, barely, about the nature. For me, love uh, is uh, against hate. And love is about, it's less busy than all of this life. But we, we know it, right? One example, uh, Jennifer just about spraying her ankles uh, five days ago. It was my birthday of the 14, and I spent the, the whole five days at home taking care of her. If I would not be that special love between one person to the other, it would be nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't know what to say. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank Someone you. asked, how would you apply or how would you apply the same strategy if it's a personal relationship like a partner or spouse or relative or someone you love, just as was just mentioned? Um, really, it's kind of the same thing. It doesn't really matter who the person is. You're trying to find out. Um, first of all, you don't want to react and mirror uh, if they're triggered or if they've triggered you. You want to think about your response. And then you want to find out what the unmet need is. That's often what triggers others. And so emotional intelligence is about thinking, OK, what's happening for that person? What's happening for them? and really try and understand what's going on. And we can't always fix things in a personal relationship. Um, we can't fix everything, but we can help them find solutions to fix things. And so that's important for us to, to recognize as well. There may be an unmet need that we can help them help, but sometimes it's not us who needs to do the work, it's them. And so we can help them by brainstorming with them about things maybe they could do. So that's a whole other course I'm thinking of that I do on, on mental health. But um, the strategies are not that different when you're talking about a partner or a spouse or relative. Okay, I think we should go yeah. Being okay. mindful of everyone's time, I'd like to thank you so much for attending. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you, um, everybody. And um, if you'd like to, uh, I want to be mindful of Lisette's time. So if there's other additional questions or things that come up, I'd be happy to forward them. Um, and I'll also be providing, like I said, the recording as well as Lisette's contact information should you want to contact her privately or separately, you would be able to do that as well. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Lisette. This was so helpful in so many ways and so many different parts of our lives. I really, really appreciated everything that you went through with us today. Um, and thank you everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. We appreciate it. And we'll be sharing all these resources and other upcoming webinars with you in our post webinar email. So take care everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Sabani.